Welcome to the webinar series organized by the Center for Social Innovation Management and the Center of Digital Economy at Surrey Business School. I'm Ithier Castelló, Associate Professor in Digital Economy at Surrey Business School, and I'll be facilitating the webinar together with my colleagues, Carla Bonina and Martin Arraga. As we all know, we live in challenging times due to COVID-19. We already know that COVID-19 is disrupting the sustainability agenda, both at policy and business level. At policy level, some examples include delays in the Glasgow Climate Summit and the proposed UK ban on single-use plastic. At business levels, my colleague, students and I are observing that firms are saying that they have been forced now to focus on the surviving mode, delaying or even canceling sustainability programs. In my own research, I'm observing how companies are recently changing from the discourse of recycling and reducing plastic waste to the new discourse of plastic safety that allows them to legitimize higher levels of plastic production and consumption, taking almost 10 years back the plastic pollution agenda. On the other hand, scientists are telling us that delaying the sustainability agenda will be devastating for rectifying climate change and reducing plastic pollution. Today, we are going to talk to two recognized speakers, Carlota Perez and Estelvia Matos, that will help us to understand a bit better the current social and economic crisis, as well as some potential solutions to build a smarter, greener, and fair global economy. Carlota Perez is a renowned British Venezuelan researcher, lecturer, uh, and international consultant that studies the mutual shaping of technical change and society and the lessons provided by the history of technological revolution for economic growth and development. She is honorary professor at the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose at University College London and at the SPRU, the Science Policy Research Unit at the University of Sussex, amongst other appointments. She is the author of Technological Revolutions and Financial Capital, the Dynamics of Bubbles and Golden Ages. Estelvia Matos is reader in social innovation and sustainability management and head of the Center for Social Innovation Management at Surrey Business School. She's also the co-editor-in-chief for Technovation, a leader technology and innovation management journal. Her research focuses on understanding the complex interactions among social, environmental, and economic factors, especially in emerging economies, and how they affect or are affected by innovation dynamics, entrepreneurial behavior, and policy development. Both researchers will look at the crisis from a slightly different but complementary perspective. Carlota will take a historical perspective on the economic crisis and will talk about the policies that need to be implemented to transitions toward what she calls a smarter, greener, and fairer economy. Estelvia will tell us about her research working on the ground with entrepreneurs that have to implement these policies and sometimes struggle. A conversation between these two perspectives can enlighten my perspective, um, innovation policy and entrepreneurship studies, as well as to provide a more holistic view on the impacts of the COVID crisis in the sustainability agenda. Um, our session today will be divided in two parts. Uh, first, we will dedicate about 40 minutes uh, to some uh, questions amongst the panelists. Then we will open the floor for uh, questions from uh, you, wherever you are, uh, the audience. Um, these will be coordinated by Martina Raca. We will finish promptly after one hour. Please use the chat box to write your questions as we will do, and we will do our best to accommodate them in the discussion. Okay, so let's start now with Carlota, and let me ask her the first question. Um, Carlota, I was surprised to hear in your recent talks that we can indeed be positive about this crisis and that it might take us to a new golden age. Can you please elaborate on this idea and how the crisis and the proposed golden age 
might take us to what you argue can be a smarter, greener and fairer economy. Carlotta, to you. Yes, of course. The reason why I think we can be optimistic is because this is similar to World War II, which was followed by the biggest boom we ever had, which was the golden age uh, post-war. And that is because this is smack in the middle of a technological revolution. The information revolution began and did the same as mass production and all the other revolutions before had done in the first couple of decades, this time even longer. Uh, there is a lot of inequality because each revolution destroys the old way of doing things. So it destroys jobs, it destroys skills, it destroys industries, regions. I mean, it is a very, very painful process. Schumpeter called it creative destruction, which is a sort of, you know, it really explains what it is that happens, that the new grows by um, destroying the old. But of course, that means that there is a new future because every technological revolution allows a leap in productivity and every technological revolution brings a golden age, but not after very bad times in terms of inequality and crashes and things, and therefore resentment, populism, this has happened each time. Think of it, in the 1930s, we had Hitler and we had Stalin. Those two extremes, we are now having it too, that people are desperate, people feel bad, and then they're offered these things by populist leaders and they follow them. So, but what happens after is perhaps a golden age. So that possibility is what we have before us. But why would the COVID pandemic be the reason? Well, because the thing is that just like a war, it, it makes people come together and feel that we all depend on each other somehow. And, you, and also because it reveals all the problems that were there during this inequality period. So we now see all the essential workers badly paid. We see that there are lots of people who are in precarious employment, the gig economy, all those things are now very clear. So what is it that happens after these moments? What happens is that governments come back and they give a clear direction for innovation and investment. They set up a win-win game be between government and, so and between business and society and they indicate the direction for innovation, the direction for investment that will be profitable because obviously we want business to be profitable and we want society to be fair. So the things that can happen after these terrible times, you don't go back to what we had before, we go forward. So going forward, we can have what, what, what happened in the previous revolution we had two main directions. One was suburban living and the other was the Cold War. So for suburban living, there was innovation in electrical appliances, in music and things, in everything that had to do with entertainment in the home. We had plastics of all sorts. We had all those things on the one hand for the suburban home and things about construction and so on. And we also have the Cold War, which gave us the internet and computers and of course missiles and all the other war things but those two things created the next revolution so uh, we are now with the possibility of using these new technologies to overcome the climate problem so we could exactly have a uh, a set of innovations, if we can provide the, the direction, that will be in everything. I mean, we can innovate in materials, in food, in health, in mobility, in almost every area, as long as the policies are there. So this is what's important, is that governments should understand that they've got to create the direction by changing the tax system, changing the welfare system. I mean, it's a huge change, just as happened when the welfare state was set up. So all those things would have to be done. Uh, but there is one very important thing to note. In the previous revolution, the mass production revolution, it was only the advanced countries of the West, sort of US, Europe, and a few others, 
that were able to take advantage of the of that particular set of technologies of that particular paradigm. Now the developing world can finally join in. And I want to just give you very quickly a little example of a big change. In Kenya, they, instead of using landlines and you know the whole system for telephone and telecommunications, they jumped directly into mobile phones. And by jumping into mobile phones, they were able to give uh, internet to everybody all over the country, even the poorest people can have that. And on top of that, they also made another leap and they have banks. So banking is also available for everybody. You know how? On the mobile phone. The mobile company became a bank. So you could deposit money in your mobile company and then you could send and use and pay money with your mobile. And this is in Kenya, in the middle of Africa, you were able to make that leap. Well, we have a whole world opening in terms of innovation everywhere in the north and in the south. Yeah, that's very interesting and understanding that there is the first time that the world is prepared to, to both global, uh, north and south can join in, in a real transformation of, of the society. It's, it's even exciting, right? Um, so thank you, uh, Carlota. So, over to you, Stelvia. You, you've been conducting research precisely in, in these uh, countries, in Brazil, uh, in Argentina, and uh, on, on entrepreneurial behavior and impoverished communities. So tell us, um, in your perspective, how individuals are responding to the challenges posed by COVID-19, um, and how do you feel they can, can be a, a source of, of change? Thank you, Itzia. Yeah, in line with Carlotta's positive view of what this crisis may bring us, we have seen some very positive responses at the level of entrepreneurial behavior in poverty contexts. From our recent field studies in favelas in the northeast of Brazil, we found that some entrepreneurs have been able to transition more easily than others from that first negative reaction created by COVID crisis and the lockdown, such as despair, fear, anger, and feeling of hopelessness, to more positive emotions, such as courage, resilience, excitement, and strength. And that have led, in some cases, to a positive outlook of what is otherwise a stressful environment with many constraints so they see opportunity for transitioning, uh, transforming actually threats into prospects and creatively combining resources at hand. I'll give you three positive examples that we have found in our research. First, we have seen entrepreneurs using ICT more creatively for marketing, distribution and supply chain management, improved financial transactions and access to institutional support initiatives that are out there for them. Uh, all of these have been replacing in a more efficient way, actually, the traditional cash only and face-to-face -face business activities that they have exclusively uh, relied on for sales, access to customers and marketing. So second, some impoverished entrepreneurs have been able to draw on each other's skills and knowledge, bringing different generations closer together, which helps to bridge the digital literacy gap. For example, while it would take a lot of effort to address digital literacy among the older population, they are now collaborating with younger people who are generally very comfortable with ICT. So we've seen cases, for example, uh, the mother who knows how to make that special coconut cake works together with the daughter who knows how to advertise the various options of style or sizes on Instagram and also manages the online payments as well. A third positive example of entrepreneurs' reactions has been that the pressure to come up with more efficient business ideas have highlighted the importance of enhancing the engagement with customers, 
listening more carefully, more closely to the new needs and reflecting on how to combine what the market is asking with what they can do with the resources that they have. I remember this particular case of a hairdresser that could not work anymore because of the lockdown, but decided to find out what people uh, still needed and decided to sell meals. And she told us that she went out and listened more carefully to what kind of, of food people wanted, when they wanted, and how they wanted to be delivered. So note that those actions and attitudes may seem quite obvious for entrepreneurs from middle and upper classes who usually have access to technical and business training, capital and strong institutional support. However, for those living in poverty, struggling to survive and with limited access to formal training and support mechanisms, the identification of these opportunities and realization of these actions actually have represent a significant change in the way they are accustomed to do business. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Estelvia. So there is some uh, opportunities to see light um, in, in the tunnel in a way, right? So Carlota, over to you now. You and, and continuing this conversation about uh, the, the COVID crisis and how to build a smarter, uh, greener and fair uh, economy. You often talk about um, this smart, green and fair economy as being very related to the circular economy, which require transformation in the lifestyles. Uh, what, in your view, are the actions, the key policies uh, that need to be taken to accelerate these transformations? Well, first of all, we have to understand something very important, and that is that each revolution provides a leap in productivity. But in order to do that, because that's what labor productivity is about, it reduces jobs and it destroys skills. So we have a solution with a big problem behind. But it has so happened throughout history that each time, each revolution has brought a major change in lifestyles. And it was those lifestyles that provided the new jobs that replaced the jobs that were lost. So we have the Victorian boom, when uh, the sort of the bourgeoisie created an urban way of living, which was different from the country, from the aristocrats, the way the aristocrats lived in the countryside. So it was building cities, building and growing cities and that and everything that each house needed and the whole construction world and the whole, all that together with railways and all the rest, of course, lots of jobs were created. Of course, it wasn't wonderful. Then we went to the next was the Belle Epoque and the Belle Epoque was these big cosmopolitan cities, even greater, but a whole world of entertainment of hotels, restaurants, cafes, a whole world of art, publications. Um, I mean, it was also a great, something that had to do with this cosmopolitan way of living. And then we leap again, we leap again in the post-war boom, which I just talked about, when we have suburban living, the American way of life with all the things that it needed, all the services, all the retail jobs, all the malls, all, the, all those things that made for the jobs that industry, you know, industry grew uh, its product by three, but it only increased its labor force by a third. But the growth of the labor force was in government and services, all related to this suburban way of living. But of course, the American way of life would be unsustainable. If we tried to, if we tried to get all the uh, Chinese and all the Indians and all the Africans, everybody to have the American way of life, forget it. We, we don't have seven planets, so we can't do it. But we can have a wonderful life that's environmentally sustainable. And that means more services, less products, truly durable products, so that everybody can have them lasting a long time. Uh, we can have exercise, nutrition, uh, creativity, all sorts of things that, are, that make a life aspirational because there is no way we're going to get people to change 
to a sustainable way of life if it is by sacrifice, if it is by guilt. We've got to do it by creating these new possibilities. And of course, that means policies, that means changing relative cost structures, changing all sorts of things, but mainly innovating in the direction of, like we're doing with music, with films, with books, all intangibles, so that in practice you have the possibility of enjoying life without necessarily having to have all these material possessions and all this waste. So of course, the smart, green, good life uh, is, is the, what we're trying to aim at. But we cannot ignore that anything that has to do with green is going to destroy jobs. I mean, we saw in America, the people really worried about fracking being stopped or oil industry being stopped. So many things, you know, that have to do with having to change our lifestyles. It will mean some jobs will be lost. So we need to make green a job creator. And I'm just going to give you a little example of what that is. But before that, I want to tell you about pay. Because a lot of people have been saying, we lost all the middle income jobs to Asia. They went to Asia, the middle income jobs, but they haven't noticed that as soon as they got to Asia, they became low income jobs. So why were they high income jobs? Not because of the technology itself. In fact, assembly jobs are not very highly skilled, but they were very highly paid for the same reason that Henry Ford said, I want my workers to be able to buy my cars and he increased their salaries because that was the whole idea. Of course, that meant that in the developing world, we had to produce cheap oil and cheap materials so that they could have high salaries. But that was the particular model and that doesn't have to be the same now. And so I'm going to give you just one example of how we could make the green economy be job creating and it's about the rental economy. Imagine that all durable goods were truly durable by law. They have to be because otherwise you have to take them back. You cannot throw them out in the rubbish then, you've got to give it back. So we create a whole rental economy. We have all spare parts. We don't produce any more spare parts. They're all on the web. You 3D print them. You have a maintenance economy with hundreds of thousands of jobs doing installation, diagnostics, everything, and, and refrigerators last 80 years, 100 years, constantly being upgraded, constantly having new parts. So you can have a very, and every product would have a chip which would tell its story. So then you buy, uh, you, you rent according to how old, how this, how that, you know, different prices and so on, like we buy used books in Amazon. So that and many others, we've got to always be thinking we cannot do green by destroying jobs only. We've got to do green by creating jobs. And that's how we will make it green and fair. And the jobs have to be well paid. And that is a social political decision that we must take. That's very interesting. Uh, thank you very much, Carlota. Um, and Estelvia, maybe now we can go to your view of the story and you can tell us a little bit about the, the how this is challenging for because this requires kind of an entrepreneurial setting an entrepreneurial process so people to be able to transition to this rental economy so um Estelvia, tell us about the challenges in these entrepreneurial processes as you see them and um how do you consider they can benefit from the opportunities you and, and carlota mentioned Yes, yes. From my perspective, it is important to pay attention to the to the challenges indeed of the entrepreneurial and innovation process, especially at the poverty level. So in my view, one of the biggest challenges is to identify the favorable conditions that lead to what William Baumol called productive entrepreneurship, or in other words, innovation that results in more winners than losers which in turn should promote sustainability and avoid unanticipated detrimental outcomes. We have known for a while that entrepreneurs' behavior depend on complex interactions among, for example, the, the characteristics of the individual and contextual factors such as institutional support, 
and changes that technological innovation may, may cause. And this is just to, to name a few. And yet a layer of complexity is added when crisis meets poverty because the absence of strong, of strong in institutions may hinder innovation and implicitly encourage non-productive business, a term that we've recently coined in one of the articles that we published. It refers to when entrepreneurs cannot access uh, adequate institutional support and as individuals, they are myopic rather than alert to business opportunities. Unlike those three examples that are of positive examples that I, I mentioned before. So while many impoverished entrepreneurs engage in business activities to survive, many fail to thrive or even worse, engage in illegal activities, what Balmer called destructive entrepreneurship. So I can think of at least two instances that illustrate the challenges posed by these complex interactions. One situation is when entrepreneurs respond to policies and incentives in different ways, analogous to the popular 1966 uh, Western movie, the, the, the Good, the Bad and the Ugly. So the good relates to entrepreneurs that very productively and creatively use resources at hand and transform obstacles into opportunities, managing to evolve in response to crisis. The bad refers to unproductive responses such as collecting the financial support uh, given by the government when they may not actually qualify for it. So taking away resources that actually uh, could help others that really need it. And finally, the ugly refers to those entrepreneurs that although having legitimate claims to that available support, they do not use it effectively for their business because they, they don't see how, they don't know how. They, these entrepreneurs fail to overcome the negative reactions triggered by, by the crisis and continue to struggle. The other illustration of complexity is when policies or innovations lack social legitimacy, which is usually defined as the support, the social acceptance, and the generalized perception of trust on a new idea, product, or policy within given contextual values, norms, and culture. So one example relates to health guidelines and interventions aiming to tackle antibiotic resistant problems in poor communities. My colleagues from the School of Medicine at the University of Sao Paulo and I were discussing that in Brazil, policy guidelines have proposed to rectify, among other problems, the indiscriminate use of antibiotic medication. But traditionally, patients always expect to receive medication to treat infections, even though it may not be necessary. It's almost like, I have a runny nose, give me a pill. And an outcome is that overuse exacerbates antibiotic resistant problems. So we found that it will be necessary to develop social legitimacy by considering culture, values, and norms where patients expect to come home with medication in order for health workers and patients to adopt the guidelines. And my final example also relates to contextual challenges. There are a number of possible ways to energy technologies currently available that can deal with urban waste, which in developing countries is mostly organic. One efficient option is to produce biogas using a combination of urban organic solid waste and sewage sludge in bioreactor that we called anaerobic digesters. However, this option requires the development of segregated waste collection schemes, which in turn requires citizen, citizen participation and awareness and consciousness and capital intensive recycling infrastructure. So an alternative, although less efficient technology is landfill-based waste to energy biogas generation because raw material is way there, readily available and in the form of often informal landfills close to favelas. 
So in this case, a technologically optimal option, which is the anaerobic digester, may not be more sustainable because the interactions with particular contextual factors uh, are gonna limit its feasibility. So I hope these examples illustrate the complexity of those factors involved in identifying the favorable conditions and uh, that can lead to sustainability, productive entrepreneurship and innovation. Yeah, thank you, Stelvia and Carlota. That, that's super interesting because on the one side, uh, we can hear Carlota saying that we need, as, as we many of us think, that we need to transition towards a more circular economy and to need, we need to enhance the rental uh, economy and, and uh, to have products that live longer, but we cannot do this transition only through guilt and that so people need to be incentivized to participate on, on these processes. Um, but, but then we also hear Stelvia, um, you Stelvia talking about some of the challenges of uh, defining some policies uh, at a level that do not take into consideration so much the legitimacy that people expect from the actors that define these policies uh, but also the social customs and, and again, these emotions um, of, um, uh, of challenging, challenge and, and guilt uh, or, or as you were saying, like um, uh, emotion of, of being reassured by, by the peers, right? That we are accustomed. So I think this is very, very interesting how we combine those things. So let's, let's move forward and, and discuss a bit in your view um, like how to do that, like um, what, what are the policies um, and, and maybe policies are not enough, but implementation, as you were saying, is as difficult as good planning. So how do we make these policies happen? Uh, what constitutes a good policy process? What things need to be changed in order to ensure a good implementation and hopefully an evolution towards this um, this better ways of, of living. Carlota, over to you. Well, once again, history. It's always history that I use. That's what my work is about. And that's how I understand what's happening. So every revolution changes the best organizational paradigm. But of course, what happens is that companies do it first because they're, they're under pressure of competition. And it takes a long time for governments to learn. So one of the problems we have today is that most governments continue to be the bureaucratic organizations with many layers that were fantastic 50 years ago, 20th century organizations, but they're no longer any good. We need imaginative, empowered platforms, networks, governments that are as agile as Amazon, really easy to use with people there who are ready to innovate and so on, because the amount of innovation that has to be done in government is enormous. If you think of all the innovations that were done for the welfare state, from unemployment insurance, pensions, uh, um, protection for people who, who had mortgages so that they would buy houses, uh, all, the, all the various things to protect the invalids, the others, and, and, and also uh, guaranteeing union rights and many things, plus the IMF, the World Bank, the, all those organizations. So it was a huge amount of innovation that had to happen. And today we need, we probably need universal basic income because we are in a world of gig economy, insecure jobs, all those things. We're not in jobs for life anymore, which is what justified just having a little bit of, of help, like a bridging thing when you lost your job. So we have many changes to make in the way that government is organized. And we have many changes to make with modern governments to change the tax system, to change the, the welfare system and the health system and all the other things that we have. So, the thing is that government, that government, very agile government has got to then signal the direction. We've already been talking about green, fair, healthy, global, all these things have to be part of how government redesigns what it does. And then 
perhaps we need to adopt what Mariana Matsukato is proposing within those directions to find missions, actual goals that will make government invest in new things, but lots of public uh, of private sector actors coming in to produce all those things so that we do achieve the various missions that would be goals, uh, both green goals, social goals, all those problems that we have. We've got to decide in five years we're going to do this, in 10 years we're going to do that, and make it very clear and put your money where your mouth is. So governments have to also invest because this idea that governments should be austere and that that's fortunately almost over now. Hardly anybody holds that. And today nobody would because of COVID. So uh, the other, and the final thing that I think is very important is the capacity to build consensus because we're talking about a win-win game. If we cannot get business on board, if we cannot get society on board, if we cannot get people to be convinced that this new direction is what we need, we won't get there. So changing the organization of government, changing the policies and making sure that both are made with total consensus, with social, of course, there'll be always some people who won't agree, but basic consensus. So we need to reunite society because right now we have these two extremes that are pulling apart and emptying the center ground, which is where this win-win game between business and society can be built. That's very interesting, Carlota. Thank you so much. And I have plenty of questions myself. I'm going to reserve them for later on, but I think this um, polarization problem is absolutely crucial to deal with. Stelvia, over to you. What lessons have we learned in the entrepreneurship arena so far that can help us to move forward the sustainability agenda? Right, I think that although we have known for some time that entrepreneurship and innovation depend on complex interactions, less attention has been focused on how these interactions affect the sustainability agenda. So it's important to ask whether our good intentions inevitably result in more sustainable societies or whether they also result in unintended consequences that will need to be addressed later. So rather than treating unanticipated outcomes as exceptions, I think they should be seen as inevitable, explored and managed as early as possible. In my view, there are two key lessons uh, learned so far. One is that individual characteristics need to uh, more attention when dealing with impoverished entrepreneurship and innovation for social inclusion. Traditionally, we have focused on institutional weaknesses of, in such environments, which is perhaps logical given that institutional weaknesses in impoverished regions are often so obvious, right, and paramount to hindering entrepreneurial efforts. But I think that now we are learning that disregarding individual factors, why some succeed, why other, uh, others fail, may result in non-productive entrepreneurship and unanticipated outcomes, which may hinder attempts at rectifying the sustainability agenda. The second lesson that I want to emphasize is that, is that the pandemic has shown the importance of searching for both obvious and not so obvious factors, such as context, how to gain social legitimacy, and with that knowledge, turning unanticipated outcomes into probabilities, manageable risks, right? I think we are starting to learn that engaging with those that may be affected by a new technology or policy implementation early in the developmental stages may pay off. But I want to go beyond that and say that we are also starting to recognize the value and quality of insights that can be found by engaging with poor communities. And to, to paraphrase my colleague, Andy De Lima, not as a monologue, but as a dialogue. We need to not say, here, do this, but we should be saying, how can we do this? So often and sadly, people take low income as low IQ, when the reality is that 
both global north and south have a lot to learn from each other and on what factors need to be considered to effectively move the uh, sustainability agenda forward. Definitely, definitely. I think uh, these are very, very important points. Um, okay, so I think um, Estelvia and Carlota have made very interesting uh, comments and share uh, their, their research and their experience. And it's now time to open the microphone to all of you that are uh, there. Thank you for joining. Um, we have people from all over a bit. So I'm, I'm seeing people from Latin America, from people from Europe. Uh, I'm very glad that these uh, Zoom capabilities give us the possibility to be open to, to participate in conversations in, in a more broader and inclusive way. So uh, let's open the floor to questions. Uh, Martin, please. Uh, there are some uh, questions that are there, but I think Martin wants to, to pick some. And uh, maybe what it will be easier is that you, Martin, just read uh, some quest one question at a time, and, and then Estelvia and, and Carlota, maybe you, you can respond. Martin. OK, thank you very much. Uh, so there are, there are several very interesting questions. I'll just start with uh, one of them by Danielle. So the question is, is uh, related to, to the tension, right, between the, these two presenters, uh, while Carlotta argues for exploiting their digital revolution, and Stelia calls for entrepreneurs to better listen to customers, right? So, but we know from Christensen research that uh, disruptive innovation, listening to cons uh, customers, can lead companies to miss these revolutions, right? Because uh, they are tied to all paradigms. So how, how can this, this tension perhaps be solved? How can we move forward? Well, uh, not all innovation is disruptive in the sense that Clay Christensen said. Disruptive innovations destroy the companies that exist. But there are thousands of innovation that solve problems that nobody has solved before. And we don't need every innovation to be disruptive. Some will be that way and others will be solving real problems. Every technological revolution provides solutions to problems, first of all, that we have never solved uh, or to problems that we didn't have before. We didn't know that we had an environmental problem. Mm -hmm. So there aren't that many companies that are going to be disrupted by the fact that a new, of course, there will be, say you bring a biomaterial that replaces an energy intensive material, well, that'll be a problem, but that's not like a mystery. You are listening, you are listening to, to people that are worried about uh, the environment. So basically there is a whole range of innovations. Some are responding to needs, new needs. Some are responding to old needs better, some are actually destroying old companies because they are disruptive in the Clay Christensen sense. So innovation does not mean destroy. It can mean add, it can mean renew, it can mean uh, do something that had never been done before. So I think there is a whole range and that's why we are talking. There is also one more thing which might say why there is this difference, apparent difference between Stelvi and I. It's basically that she's talking about innovation in the poorest sectors of society. And I'm talking about innovation across the globe. So of course, those two things to begin with were difficult to face. And we have been trying to sort of connect them up. That's exactly what this seminar is about. Mm -hmm. Exactly, Stelvia. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I totally agree with uh, Carlotta. Not all inno innovation is destructive. It actually, uh, it solves some problems and create others, right? Is this constant... Good point. Yes, evolution of... And, and this is how the entrepreneurs, whether, you know, in the poverty level or high up, should be conscious about the constant search for, you know, what, what, what else we, what is going to come up that we're going to have to innovate again. So, and this is quite dynamic and exciting, I think. Yeah, thank you very much. And, and I think this, this question is 
rightly to the point, like putting together these two perspectives in, in our view was a way of helping us to think forward of how we can learn from um, um, different ways of innovating, but also how people see differently um, the new economy and, and, and the sustainability agenda, which is the, the um, topic of, of this webinar. Uh, fantastic. Let's go through an, uh, to another question. Uh, Martin. Okay, so yeah, th there's also, uh, there are some questions related to, especially to the, to the idea of, of how this revolution, this technological revolution is whether green or not, right? So for example, artificial intelligence is, is a very, is a major energy consumer. Uh, so IT companies are major uh, research consumers. And the digital economy is, uh, is kind of really silent about this, this topic. So well, uh, what, what will be the, the, right, uh, the right policies? What will be the, 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 the how, how, how this can be handled in order to the revolution to occur, but also to, to handle this side, uh, this, uh, this side of, of the current revolution? Okay, first of all, we have to realize that what they're using is electricity. And it so happens that electricity can be made from renewables, from biofuels, from all from all the you know solar waves uh wind whatever so eventually we could have all energy being renewable and therefore information technology can continue using lots of energy but they are trying to reduce their energy consumption they are innovating towards say for instance going from um, alternate current to direct current, which is what our USBs and all those things, the reason why we need transformers is precisely because we're using uh, direct current rather than alternate. So that's why we're, we, we have this little transformer in almost every computer. So they're trying to find a way of going directly. And that of course, and if we end up having electricity mainly with batteries, maybe that will change. So that is a problem, but it is not an unsolvable problem. And we actually, because information technology is what will allow us to dematerialize and reduce energy consumption everywhere else. For instance, if we had interactive smart grids where we could all have solar or whatever, and we could sell and buy electricity at the, or use electricity when it's cheaper and then not use it when it's expensive. Every weekend, every factory that's not working over the weekend will sell all its electricity from solar or from whatever it does into the grid. So we can have a, a, a system that takes advantage of all the things that information technology can do in order to reduce the amount of energy that we need, but especially to, to get rid of the fossil fuel nature sorry, of, uh, of current electricity. That's very interesting, Carlota. Thank you very much. Uh, Stelvia, do you want to say something about this particular question? Um, well, I was just wondering how can we relate this to the poverty level? Um, I guess, you know, if talking about energy, I'm going to have to start talking about, you know, smaller size facilities and localized uh, um, approaches is instead of the big full blown, you know, huge infrastructure. Um, and, and this is what we've been pushing, right? Um, um, using renewable resources, like the example that I mentioned, the waste to energy option. Uh, at, at that level, this is the kind of alternatives that are very interesting. Some of them are very viable. We just have to um, count with the um, uh, help and collaboration of those involved. But at, at that level, we, we do need something smaller and localized. That's very important and very interesting, Stelvia. In fact, continuing with the Kenya example, one of the things that they managed to do was to s sell, sort of rent, uh, solar panels in villages way, way far so that they can get electricity. They can then charge their mobile phones so they can have banks, thanks to that. 
with the mobile phone, they paid the rent for the solar power and the solar power allowed them to have illumination and to read and to do the whole thing. And, and of course we are in most poor countries tend to be in the tropical zone. So we have lots of solar, but we also have wind and, you know, so the new energies can actually be much more capable of providing energy to the poor than our old systems with a long central thing with lots of cables going, you know? So we are actually better off in terms of helping the poor yeah. in yeah. energy terms. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Thank you very much. Um, Martin, um, can I say one question? Because there is a question that is very close to my heart. Um, Bobby Barnergy says, in the solutions you have articulated, green economy, rental economy, innovation, entrepreneurship, I'm wondering if there is an implicit assumption that all these are possible in the current paradigm that privileges economic growth without using the prefix sustainable that magically transforms economic growth as a solution to the climate emergency. Can you have innovation without growth? A green deal without economic growth? Thank you, Bobby, for this question. No. <laughs> I am a big fighter against this degrowth idea. The poor of the world will not allow us not to grow. We need a lot of wealth, but what do we need? We need to change the nature of growth, not the rhythm. We need more growth, but the nature. I mean, right now we are producing value. The question of what is value is a big question, a very central question today. And the whole idea that growth is all about using all the materials of the planet, that is getting stuck in the mass production paradigm, in that wasteful energy intensive, materials intensive, you know, that old paradigm, which is obsolete. That's what allows people to think that we cannot grow. We can grow even this rental model. This rental model means, imagine, no more spare parts. That's tons of material and energy that we save. Uh, uh, having a refrigerator that can last for five people's lives rather than five refrigerators for every life. So, you know, it's a, it's a radical change, sharing economy, so that instead of having to have everybody have their own bits of things, we can share whenever we need them, all the things that, you know, there are so many things that we only need every once in a while, including cars, by the way. So the whole, we have to rethink the whole thing and we need high productivity. So we will need robots in one part of the economy. We will need artificial intelligence in one part of the economy, ethically used, we've got to regulate and we've had to, but basically the, the change that has to come about is one that changes the nature of growth, but does not change its rhythm. It actually increases its rhythm because we have to include everybody. This has got to be the revolution that lifts all boats every single country will grow. And the reason why we need every single country to grow is because we also need to be able to produce in the advanced world, the engineering and the, and the capital goods that are sustainable so that the developing world can develop. And for that, we're going to need special taxes and all the rest because without that, the Chinese would be the only ones that are producing consumer goods. We need a much bigger global economy, but of course, with re significantly reduced use of materials and also biomaterials, circular materials. It's a different way of growing. And it's a lot of services, a lot of intangibles. It's a long discussion that, you know, it would take a whole webinar to discuss that. And it's very important to stop associating saving the planet with degrowth or no growth or whatever. I think that is a very dangerous Malthusian attitude which we must reject. I think this is fascinating. I think we should organize another webinar just to discuss growth versus degrowth because um, uh, I, I know Bobby well, I sympathize with many of the people that even in my research 
um, that in the ground that, that talk about, for example, in plastics, the impossibility of uh, dealing with all the waste that we are using. And it needs, it, first we need to think about how, how to think differently, how to consume differently, and maybe then we can think about how to grow differently. But this is very, very interesting. Thank you, Carlo. Dan. Um, Estelvia, you want to say something uh, about this point or? Yes, yes. I was going to say that I, I definitely agree with, with the, the need to change our thoughts and uh, what we think about what growth means. Uh, the nature of growth has to change. And uh, speaking about the, uh, the way of consuming things, I think we have a lot to learn from the global South because they've always been, uh, they, they've been living all their lives by having to save energy. They have to save, they don't have the money to pay. So they have to be conscious about not spending much. They don't spend much plastics and paper. So we actually need to listen more carefully and, and, and learn those lessons from this way of, of living in a, in a positive way, you know, in a, in a productive way. Yeah, thank you. And, and I guess this uh, tries to answer a bit the question, the second question that Bobby is, is uh, writing, like who is we, right? And this is a whole debate, but Estelle is bringing the, the global South perspective, which is what also we wanted to, to do in, in this debate. Okay, so unfortunately, we don't have time for more questions and there are super interesting questions, but we are going to um, uh, copy them and, and think about them and, and send them to, to Carlota and Estelvia. Thank you very much for so interesting questions. I would like to close this webinar uh, asking Carlota and Estelvia uh, for a final concluding remark on uh, the things that we've talking about and how, how we can rethink about the sustainability agenda based on what we discussed today. So just um, a couple of sentences, please, or um, a minute each. Um, Carlota, do you want to start? Thank you. Okay. Well, I guess what I would like to say is that we must always remember that the way forward involves innovation, that we've got to change, that's what it's about. That the new technologies do not determine the future. Society does, we do, we determine our future. And that means together and all members of society have got to participate in determining the future. And we also have to remember that catastrophes such as wars and pandemics can serve to open our eyes, to make us see that we're all together. And they also create the opportunities not to reconstruct the past, but to construct a better future. That's what I think we need to understand. Thank you, Carlota. Uh, Stelvia. Yes, I'm very optimistic. I think if we think of what's been happening and what has happened, with this pandemic, it has allowed for an extraordinary experiment that has exposed some cracks, but it has also highlighted a lot of positive examples and resilience. And I think the lessons are out there. It is up to us to have the capacity to learn and to get the sustainability agenda right. Thank you very much. Um... Thank you for these final comments. Uh, I think for me, at least, uh, what I take out from this conversation, which has been very interesting, is that first we are looking at history and looking at what is happening in, in other places, uh, in, in Brazil, um, in these favelas, we are able to uh, think uh, uh, about the positive sides of, of a crisis. And I think in this moment, for me at least, it's, it's very important. Um, but second, what I learned today is that, and that was triggered by Bobby's question of who is we, but also Carlota talking about polarization uh, of the world. We need to understand, and again, I'm using we as if I, if I was a, if it was a majestic, but 
uh, understanding who, who do we have to mobilize, how can we mobilize people, how can we reduce this polarization is, is key in this moment. And, and probably some of our efforts in research and in activism as citizens and need to be directed towards this. Um, thank you very much, it's time. Thank you so much, Carlota. Thank you so much, Estelvia. Thank you everybody for participating. Martin, uh, Carla behind. Uh, I think that has been a very interesting conversation. We will continue creating these spaces for debate in future webinars. Uh, so please check up our emails and, and website. And uh, thank you again and goodbye for now. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.